things at least. Right, um, I, I'm ready to go. Um, All right. I'm not sure if people are there yet. C can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Um, do you want to start by introducing yourself right. too? Yep, um, I'm Imran Iqbal. I've been uh, heading up the formulas maintenance for the last year and a half or so. Um, been running formulas actually for the last four or five years. Uh, been running salt for a bit longer than that. And uh, didn't really get involved properly, like I said, for until about the last two years. And I'll show you where I started from. And I'll go on to explain this whole diagram uh, shortly. Um, are there any of the other major contribu co contributors around? Anyone else joined in just yet? Uh, well, I'm here. I'm David. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you want to just give us a little? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Um, well, I've been using salt for about four years. Um, but my usage has grown and really, yeah, the same as you kind of got more into it the last two years or so. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm a major contributor to the formulas, but I am a contributor at least. Um, and yeah, I'm just interested to see where this goes. Um, I'm, I'm Cassandra Ferris. I'm the community manager at SaltStack. So my role in all of this is just to, as people want to form work groups and other things and try and help coordinate that. Um, for those who can't attend these sorts of things, I'm also the person who uploads things to YouTube. So all of these things are on YouTube if you want to see what you missed. And I'm here to just kind of help facilitate communications and um, answer questions that you all might have. So. Excellent. Is there anyone else around or someone wants to introduce themselves? Hello, I'm Daniel. Uh, I'm using uh, salts uh, since several years ago, and uh, um, I'm baby new on uh, GitHub. So I contribute to TOFS and uh, the new proposal for map.jinja. Okay, that, that's great. It's good, to, it's good that you're here because uh, we can have some interesting conversations together now, finally. And I, I know these guys over the last few years, like I said, last couple of years working together, but we've never spoken before. So this is the first time for us to, to get to know each other in an actual meeting, but it'll be interesting to see how it goes this way. Is Eric around or Javier? No? Uh, anyone else, Cassandra, that might want to say something? I think so. I was looking to see if Tyler was logged on, but it looks like he's in the midst of something else. So I'll just give it another minute. My cat just needs to go out. Just one second. <laughs> and my dog wants to be on my lap and she's kind of pouting because I won't let her sit up here right now. Okay, um, shall I just begin then? Yeah, go for it. Right, okay. Uh, this is uh, a diagram of what has happened pretty much a lot of it over the last year and a half, two years. Some of it was already in place beforehand, but what we'll do, we'll just work through the diagram uh, from sort of step zero, if you like. So starting with the, the GitHub organization of salt stack formulas, I'd like to start with our repositories. So if we just go into this for a minute. And this is quite interesting even for myself because I was surprised to see uh, how many of the repositories are actually in use. So let's zoom in here a second. Right. So we've got about 330 repositories. Uh, I think there's been a few more added actually in the last few days. So if I just, can you see all of this? Can you see my browser as well? Is everything visible? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's fine. Excellent. So you see now we have 300, 337. That was only about 330 a few days ago. I think Noel's uh, added a few more repositories just recently. So just if you, if you were to work through these, uh, well, I've just done that, and you can get an idea of what that breakdown is. So of the 330, there are about 70 which have been enabled for what we call semantic release. Uh, I'll explain that as we go along. These are, you could imagine, they're quite active repositories in general. Uh, and looking through in terms of time periods, you've got in the last six months, there's perhaps another 40 which uh, have had, ha had some sort of activity on them. And within the last year, another 40. And then you get 40 within the last two years after that. And then there are a good, almost half of the repositories are actually inactive or unmaintained. Uh, you know, over the duration of two to five and a half years. Uh, and what I did notice is some of these are actually empty placeholder fo uh, formulas, where I think there was an intention to start a formula for that particular uh, software or solution, and it never came to fruition. So that would be something to look into as to what our plans are with all of these, really, all of the ones at the bottom, really. But um, just you know, what, what's happening there. So it gives a, a rough idea of what's going on within those 330 repos. Uh, by the way, sir, I'd like to just say, if you have any comments, because I'm, I'm going to try and give it, my plan was to go through, um, oh, we're getting our messages. My plan was to go through quite quickly to give a spread of all of what formulas uh, does and touches upon but I have no problem at all if we stop at a certain point or if people want to bring up discussion points because I'm happy to discuss at any point, but I will otherwise keep moving forward. So please feel free to just chime in and just ask a question or say something or add it to the chat. And I, and I think someone will mention it to us during this conversation. Uh, in terms of this page or this breakdown in general, you'll see there's all sorts of other entities on this page and I'll come to them as we discuss further but one or, one or two that are worth looking into now is this one over here which is code owners. Uh, GitHub provides a facility uh, for allocating code owners to each repo and we've had a discussion about it and generally the feedback was okay uh, I'd like to tap into if anyone has, has any experience with code owners uh, files in their repos. But the idea behind it is you allocate certain, um, you allocate certain users to maintain certain parts of the formula. So for example, some people can be the actual owners of a repo and otherwise certain files, for example, could be for another user or two. And the idea is to break down the repo into, a, into people who actually maintain certain parts of the content. Uh, at a formulas level, I don't really expect it to be broken down in terms of, you know, certain types of files within the formula I buy some, pe some people and I'd rather think it was the whole formula because what I'd really like to see is each formula having someone allocated to it because it seems the original authors of these formulas have pretty much disappeared. Uh, I, I haven't seen many of them, uh, people who've started up formulas who are still around today. So is there anyone who has any experience with code owners that could just share what they found with respect to that? Uh, no, I have no experience with it. A anyone else with anything at all? My question would be, would that be a useful way to try to uh, reduce this unmaintained or inactive formulas basis that we have here? Because like I said, if you look, you know, the red and the black here, that, that's all formulas that aren't really being used for very much at all, I, I can imagine. You know, if they haven't been maintained for two years, I'm not sure anyone's actually even using them today. Or if they are, they're probably using their own forks and not the actual repos that we have in our organization. Is that fair enough to assume? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 
So I'd like to do something about those. I'd like to, uh, not, not right now, we don't have to make a decision right now, but I would like to make some sort of policy with respect to these older formulas, what should happen so that we can streamline a little bit and work towards being more effective with this organization. Anyway, since there's no more comments about the code owners for now, let's just go back to the main diagram. And let's move on to the next part, which is the template formula. Now, if we look at, sorry, do you see my, do you see a little a black box here? Is that blocking your view on, on the, on the right-hand side over here? Are you seeing this area here? We're seeing it, yeah. That, can you see through it? Because that, that's actually part of my Zoom view. Is, is that blocking your view? Uh, no, it's see through. Sorry? I don't think anything. I don't see anything. Well, but, yeah, it's, it's white. OK, let's get this out of the way. Can you see more now? Uh, I mean, the, the thing you're indicating is, is transparent. <laughs> It's transparent. Can you now actually see the screen? You can see GitHub. Yeah, we can yeah? see all of it, or at least I can. Perfect. Fine. Okay. So the template formula has been the formula we've done the most work on together as a as an organization, where we've tried to collect, you know, our best practices that we've agreed upon, discussed and, and decided these are the things that we'd like to uh, use throughout um, the organization for new formulas coming through and when we adapt old formulas to new structure. So looking at the template formula in some detail, uh, let's start with, what was the part I wanted to start with with respect to it? Okay, let's take this one for example. This was an issue that we started uh, quite early on uh, last year, where we were thinking about what could be done across the whole organization, things that should be added into the template formula. So we set different headings and we added checkboxes for all sorts of ideas. And as you can see, we worked through those and we started adding them to the template and then pushing those through to other formulas over time. Um, so these are, like I said, some of the agreements and discussions that we had, whether it was on Slack or in issues themselves and, and whatnot. Uh, but as David mentioned before, he said, you know, the information is all over the place and all this work we've done over the year and a half, you'll find there's bits in issues in say the template formula and there are bits in discussions or in team discussions on GitHub, some in Wiki, and we really do need to find a solution for centralizing that into one place. Uh, and I, I'll mention some things in a, li in a little while as to how we can resolve that. Another interesting feature we've now managed to reach with the template formula is the use this template feature. So if I just go up for a second, you'll see at the top here, you have this use this template button over here. And um, what that allows you to do if you click on it, it allows you to set up a new formula, give any repository name you like, and it will clone the formula, uh, clone the template formula into it. And then what David's, maybe David can speak about it a little, little bit is you can actually then run this script that he's put together for us, which will convert it to the name that you've chosen for your new formula. Would you like to mention a few words about it, Dev? Um, well, there's not a huge amount to say other than it basically um, yeah, well what we've done is in the, in the template formula we've kind of chosen a keyword, a unique keyword for all kind of replacements in the, in the formula itself, the places yeah. where you would want replacements to be made. And so, yeah, I, my script just makes those replacements. So it will um, replace template in all capitals to whatever um, 
the name of your application or whatever. And it also kind of removes some files that are not required, um, things which are specific to the template, some of the testing. But yeah, I mean, really, it sets up a new, a new formula repository, which is ready to go, really, with all of the features that we've all kind of come to expect from from a formula so all the map.ginger um and also it's kind of modularized in a way so that we've got the states for package service and a configuration so yeah i mean i've used it myself a couple of times and it's it's, it's fairly simple really and it's actually very useful uh it's really helped you know, adjust, if you do need to write a new formula now, you don't have to sit there making a clone of the template formula and manually going through changing all the bits that you need. It will actually, like David said, it will change all the bits where the keyword template in uppercase is, but it also removes sections. What file was that again, David? Where, where does it remove from, for example? Was it Travis? Um, Travis, wasn't it? it re yeah, it removes from Travis, it removes from... Uh... Oh, some RuboCop config. So yeah, if you, there's a remove me section there that you've yeah. got there. So for example, this is a section that only applies to the template formula. So when you do make a clone of the template, you wouldn't want to keep this in your new formula. So the script will also work through this and find the two tags, the beginning and the ending tag for remove me and take those sections out as well. So it pretty much makes a pristine brand new formula for you to start working with. Uh, and this would be the way we'd encourage people who want to make new formulas, especially if they want them to be brought into the organization, that they should actually use the use the template button and then run the script that's available in the bin folder. Uh, just here, which is convertformula.sh. If that's run, obviously on a Linux system, it will prepare the template I'll prepare your new formula with a new namespace as you need it, which is very useful. Uh, a small point here, it's nothing very important. Uh, changes that are made to the template formula in order to facilitate discussion, those automatically get pinged into Slack, into the formulas channel, which I know some people haven't really liked, but it's there so that it just gives a notification that there are ideas or there are merges that are perhaps taking place that will affect the way the template moves forward uh, and it gives a chance for people to discuss that beforehand before those changes are made. And I've also put two symbols here. These are actually for documentation. Um, and I'll actually pull these up uh, a bit later on. But we've been talking about how to document across the whole organization because where you have documents in each repo, uh, it's very difficult to see the common thread amongst all of the repos. So what we're thinking of is having a different solution, something like Read the Docs or another one called Antora, which I'll talk about, like I said, a bit later. Uh, and you then have a central location for all of the formulas and then for the common, so, uh, the common ideas that are shared across formulas all in one place. And I do have some examples of that that I can show. So that's the template formula. Uh, the next area, like I said, anyone wants to chime in, you're welcome to before I move on. No? Okay, this is my map.ginger map discussion. Um, one common thread that was uh, put in place, I believe right from the beginning, five and a half years ago with the formulas, was to have a map.ginger as the basis of each formula. And it's gone through iterations over time. So if we look over here, I've just sort of given an example of what some of the uh, iterations looked like. So version one and there are a number of formulas that are still in version one of map.ginger they're just purely in uh, in ginger tags uh there's no yaml involved at all uh it's quite straightforward in fact this actually matches the the documentation that's uh the salt documentation for formulas it still shows the version one style sort of map.ginger uh that can be used and it's simply a grains dot filter by uh maybe with a default maybe with some os families uh, and then merging in the, the lookup uh, afterwards from the pillar. And what you see 
uh, over time, there were some what I call version two formulas that came through. And the version two formulas would involve some sort of YAML. So they were stripping out some of the data from the ginger and putting them into YAML files uh, and then performing the filtering and then the pillar merges on top of that. So that's the sort of version two. And you, you might also see they involved defaults.merge. But as we found out afterwards, defaults.merge has issues with salt SSH. So we actually, we actually had to avoid that in the end, which is why we ended up moving on to version three. Now, version three is the one that's in the template formula right now. Um, and it's fairly robust. It's, it's, it, it covers SSH. It, it covers multiple YAML files. So you'll tend to see defaults and all the OS YAML files, whether they're family or OS map, code name, or whether OS finger. All of them are included, and then they're all merged in a grains.filter by tree. This wasn't ideal, uh, but like I said, we had to support um, we had to support salt SSH at the time. So we ha we found that grains.filter by covered that at the time, and finally at the end, it merges in the rest of the config. And in, in this case, it also uses config.get. This is one of the other major changes that was made in version three. Um, and the reason behind config get is because there was a, a large discussion where a lot was mentioned about pillars being, uh, pillars shouldn't always be used for all data because of the performance hit on the master. Uh, and rather you should open up, um, by using config.get, config you allow other data sources such as SDB, or mini and config files, or the file system to provide the actual data. So uh, I've, I've linked it here to the SDB that's provided by SALT. Um, so I, I was thinking uh, SDB module, if I just jump out for one minute, I can uh, show One second. So these are the. I'll just zoom in a little bit. There are numerous SDB modules that uh, people might want to use for their data rather than pillars. And the idea behind using config.get was to allow these data sources to be used instead. And in fact, uh, is, is Claude here who put together a stack formula, which was based upon YAML. Is he around? Anyway, about a year ago, one of the contributors, actually not much so much the formulas, but to actual salt stack, put together a stack formula, which actually allowed us to use SDB to, to use uh, YAML files in, uh, via SDB rather than using pillars. And that was a very interesting uh, uh, experiment at the time. And it did really work well, except for the fact of trying to populate the YAML files in the first place was quite difficult. You actually had to do one run to populate the YAML files and then another run to actually use them. So it kind of fizzled out in the end. But that was the idea behind config.get. So going back to that for one second. And we have a, a, a version four and it's far more, it, it, it's far more complicated as well, but it's far more thorough. Uh, Daniel, would, would you like to discuss version four briefly? The new proposed map.ginger? Yes, if you want. Yeah, please, it'd be great to hear it from your side. <laughs> well, the idea was to uh, generalize <clears throat> the use of, uh, of uh, map.ginger for near everything and to fix the complaints about uh, using pillars too heavily which can impact performance on the master. So the idea is to uh, split uh, the pillars into static files uh, served by the file server. And um, they are um, uh, computed by the minions. So uh, each time a minion need to get a configuration value it use it's a, it evenly use config get um, 
it gets a, a list of sources where to get uh, the, the values based firstly on uh, grains, like as you see, as uh, Herman is, is showing us OS or OS family. And uh, the idea is to get um, each value, each grain value, a dedicated YAML file, because personally, I, I only care about Debian and Ubuntu uh, OS. So for maintenance, I don't care about others personally. But it's, I find it easily uh, easier to get um, uh, this layout because I only need to put one file in the tree to cover my own needs. And um, well, how, what to say? Okay, yeah, that, that, that's, that's great. So what, 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 what he's done here is he's allowed pretty much every part of the merging and the overriding to be configurable. So you can have a separate folder uh, with your parameters. So the formula provides the defaults uh, and the, the recommendations. And any of those recommendations or defaults you don't like, you can override in your own separate parameters folder uh, and remove them entirely or override them with a blank or add all your custom values. The way I like to explain it, and a lot of these developments is I feel personally they resemble what Pillar Stack brought to Pillars, where you can use any level of grains to override, you know, the pillars to be specific to a specific OS or to an ID of a particular minion or whatever you like. And this new map.ginger, it is turning more into a black box. Uh, and in a way, I think that's a good thing. Maybe people will disagree with me about this, but by having a map.ginger, which is literally constant per formula, and it does everything uh, the same way for all formulas, what will happen is the formulas can provide whatever they like, and the user doesn't have to even worry about what it's giving them because they can override any part of it that's appropriate to them. So just having a quick look, I tried to strip some of it down because it's quite complicated. Uh, it's quite a complex um, implementation, but if you look at each part, so for example, the map sources here, for example, this is the default provided map sources in that priority. So you can have OS Arch, OS Family, OS, OS Finger, then the config.get lookup and the config get, which is the difference being think of it like the pillar lookup and then the pillar itself. Uh, and then finally the ID, because sometimes none of that really matters. You, you need the ID based values to come through for that particular server or that particular device and that should be the final override. But if you don't like this that we've set here, the map.sources for the formula, you can override the map sources in your own config and only use the one or two that matter to you. So for example, you may only care about the OS family and the ID and everything else doesn't matter or maybe the OS family config.get and the ID. And that gives you the full configurability for that. Another part it brings is um, it works for both salt SSH and it works for regular minions or, or local. So it looks at what type of uh, command or where the command is being run and it evaluates whether it's minion or whether it's local. And then it does uh, the full config.get because config.get on salt SSH doesn't allow you to set a merge strategy. So it will only do that if it's a, a minion which is local or a, a regular minion. Otherwise it won't uh, apply the merge strategy to it. Uh, what's this part here, Daniel? Let me see if I can remember. Oh, yeah, the SLS utils.merge. Oh, that's good. I see another thing. Shouldn't we rewrite Ginger to Python? Something easy to read. Brilliant. Eric, are you there? Can you, can you bring that point up? That would be great because I, I did want to talk about that. Eric? Hello. It's not directly uh, about what you're saying, it's just an idea that pops in my mind that uh, maybe what I don't like with this map.ginger uh, more complex is that it's it's difficult to read the uh, ginger and when you have a lot of merge it's complicated to track uh, the data where it is where, what you're merging with with uh, what and uh, yeah. maybe uh, make a, a Python model uh, inside the formula or inside the salt maybe later 
can be a, a good idea? I don't know. I agree with you personally, because what I've seen is as we're maturing uh, a lot of these methods, uh, I believe a lot of them could be converted into Python and made more usable, you know, more generally across formulas and maybe elsewhere. So I agree, but I think what we're doing, I feel like this process has been trying to understand what works and what doesn't work and building that maturity. Uh, it is in ginger. It's not particularly nice. It's not easy to follow, but if it proves it's, if it works, like for example, TOFS, uh, TOFS, which we'll talk about shortly, the, I believe personally that's proved itself. I think it's doing exceptionally well. And I think that's something worth considering for the next stage, whatever that next stage is. Uh, so for sure, for sure, that's a good idea. What, what I'm impressed about with this, and I know we have difference of opinion and, that, and that's great and it's good to talk that through, is it allows people to use formulas exactly how they want to use formulas without preventing people using formulas the way they are used to. So if someone wants to stick to using pillars with no other configuration other than what the normal previous map.ginger used to do, they can still do so with, and this should be fully reverse compatible. Uh, and we, we're testing that idea out. We've already implement, implemented this in the libvert formula and we'll slowly you know, see which other formulas we can try this out in without major disruption. And if it shows that it's, it's doing that, then we can start gaining trust. So I'm not planning or I'm not necessarily saying we have to push this into the template too soon because there may be a lot of questions, but I think if there are formulas which are maybe, you know, where the, where the maintainers there or the people using it are more willing to consider it, maybe we can start with those formulas. I'm not sure. A any ideas about that? Seems like a sensible idea. Okay. All right, that's great. I think what we'll do, we'll skip past the rest of this, but the idea behind it, it gives you that full uh, configurability to you know, choose how you'd like to um, uh, use your, your black box, this map.ginger, to do what you want it to do with the formula and have the data anywhere you like, you know, whether it's in SDB, whether it's in your file. See, what this is doing, what I found, it's really useful for me, and I, I've been using this personally, uh, a slightly stripped down version, is I've been putting everything into the file system now. You know, I, I'm no longer using uh, the pillar that much. Everything that can go into the file system, I'm putting into YAML files on the file system instead, and they work immediately. Uh, and that's one of the um, tips I received on Slack from some of the other users, was to use the file system more, because that doesn't put the strain on the master, and nor does it have the chicken and egg problem. You don't have to find a way to put it on the, the file system first and then use it. It's as soon as you put it there, like a, a pillar file, as in, in the same way you'd put a pillar file onto your file system, onto your system, the same way you can add a YAML file to your file system in this parameters folder, and it uses it the same way. So I, I think it's quite an impressive piece of work, and I, I thank Daniel for putting it together. And I'd like to, we can obviously discuss it in the weeks to come, but it's something that I think is very, you know, is worth considering definitely for wider use over time at least. Okay, so moving on a little bit over here. We also had a discussion about what the meaning of the pillar lookup is, because I'll be honest with you, the original intent of what the lookup was supposed to be, I'm still not 100% clear on. Uh, and we did have quite an extensive, extensive discussion about this. Um, and there were different ideas. Can, can anyone, like maybe verbally I'd understand it better, but is there a clear definition of what the pillar lookup is supposed to do? I can try. <laughs> go, yeah, go for it, for sure. Uh, in my idea, the lookup uh, pillar, as, it, as I saw it in uh, earlier formulas, was to define the core parameters of the formula. And uh, what I, I mean by that is uh, all the, the values which are specific to the way the formulas handle uh, software, uh, for example, engine Linux or Asha proxy or whatever. Uh, the, the way the formula needs to know where 
I put the where the config files are uh, installed in the in the file system, for example, or what the names of the servers that it needs to to start, and uh, those parameters are different from the parameters you inject generally by pillar, which has which are your uh, your um, needed values. For example, uh, you listen to your web server listens on on the port 80 or 40, 43. Uh, those are the values you you want to inject in the software and uh, the lookup values are more managed, used by the formula itself, not by, not, not by your usage of the formula. I'm not sure I'm clear. So, no. so anything that's changeable, do you mean things that you would modify going the pillar and things which are sort of set, stay, stay within the lookup? I, I, see, I still don't quite get the distinction. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand exactly what you mean. I, I'm saying, are you saying the things that need, that will definitely, definitely need to be changed, they will go in the main pillar, and the things which are, see, I don't understand a bit about the formula, the, 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 how did you define the lookup? What was the thing you said, sorry? Uh, yeah, uh, okay, uh, you're right. The, 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 the values you, you should normally uh, need to, to change are what I call the main pillars. For example, uh, I don't know, the user you generate, the, the okay. SSH configuration you want to push on your servers. And, uh, and uh, the, the lookup ones, Generally, you don't move it because the formula knows what are the good parameters. Know that uh, engine, Nginx has its configuration in slash DC uh, Nginx, uh, that the service is named Nginx, uh, and something like that. Right. Okay. Well, I think we can have more discussion about this over time because right now it's obviously just a review. Uh, and another point, just briefly, is uh, something that's been mentioned even in the, the open hour when we spoke with, uh, uh, when we first spoke about setting up a formulas work group, is the idea that um, if you can move to JSON, JSON is always more performant than YAML, primarily because everything is converted back to JSON before it's processed by, by SALT. So the more we can put into JSON, the better. And there's been ideas about it. We won't, we won't talk about it now, but there's ideas of how we could possibly achieve this. Uh, there's an issue that's open for this, but I won't, I won't open it right now. But that's everything to do with map.ginger. Let's try to move on a little bit. So after map.ginger, we have the first of our CI. So the main uh, CI we run is Travis for, for formulas. Uh, it works reasonably well. Uh, there's been some downtimes at times. Uh, the concurrency isn't great. So across the whole organization, we have five concurrent uh, builds that can run, uh, five concurrent jobs that can run at the same time. So if there is a, a backlog, if there are two or three PRs going in at the same time, the second and third PR will be blocked until the first PR clears its jobs. So it's been okay. We haven't had too much activity maybe recently, so we haven't noticed, but there have been times in the past where we've had a backlog of maybe five or six um, uh, PRs maybe running at the same time. But Travis itself, just digging into it a little bit, uh, if you look at, for example, Travis YAML file, uh, what we've done, we've sort of standardized it where we have the linters at the top. Uh, I've put black in here, not because we use it at the moment, but I've got an idea about that that I can maybe discuss a bit later. Uh, but the main ones we run, we run salt lint, uh, which is a, a Python package, YAML lint. So we, we, we lint the salt itself and the, the YAML, and then we lint the Ruby for our inspect tests, or if there's a service spec there, then it'll lint those. Uh, we also lint our commit messages. Um, I'll come into the commit messages about semantic release in a short while, and um, we also lint any bash, any any scripts that are in the uh, the repository. So that's the first part of one job will be allocated to linting. Then the next and the main part, obviously, is uh, let's see what I've got here. Do I have? 
Okay, I've just got the, the main salt stack. The main salt stack. Um, so these are some recent formulas that have failed, but generally we have a good pass rate. Um, if we were to go into any one of them, let's say the Zabbix formula, you'll see that we have uh, the linting job is the first job. So it does the salt lint, the YAML, the Rubicop, shell, check and commit lint. And then we have a selection of platforms um, that we run and we try to stay to about six or seven maximum. We actually have seven platforms that we normally um, work with and I'll show you those in a minute. Um, and then there's a, a release stage which actually performs the semantic release which actually bumps, bumps the version number, it updates the change log, it updates the authors um, as a final stage if all of these checks pass. So that's mainly what Travis does. There is also, we've got one instance of running salt check from salt stack, which is a new development uh, in the cron formula, but time's a bit short now, so I'll just skip past that. But right now we found that using inspec has, has worked out better because it leads to uh, uh, short, uh, actually the code is much more, it's not as verbose as say salt check, and it's using something else other than salt to test it, to test salt. So rather than using something that uses salt itself to do the verification, we're using a separate tool altogether to make sure that verification is performed without any, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Er Eric, you had a good word for it before, last time. No? Can't remember. Well, it's an independent test, I, I would say that. Yeah, that's what it is. So it's not being done by the same tool that's actually performing the changes and testing itself. So it's being tested by an independent uh, verifier instead. Okay, so there's Travis is our main CI. We also tried Cirrus, Cirrus CI for, for, uh, for a few of our repos. And the idea behind that was the concurrency was actually a lot better. You can run maybe up to 10 instances at the same time. The only problem we found with it was it's much slower uh, because they don't have any caching available for their Docker uh, for their Docker runs. So it was a lot slower, so we didn't really go towards it, but we still have a couple active right now, which, you know, still perform pretty much what Travis does. Uh, if I was to go into one of these, you'll, you'll see. It still runs a selection of um, instances from various platforms across various salt versions and Python versions. We have a, a matrix where we try to make sure we balance out all of the different platforms and the different versions of salt if we can. So that's Cirrus. I don't have much more time. Uh, should we just leave some time for some questions if there are any of what's happened so far? Have there been any questions so far in the chat? Uh, do we have to finish uh, at five or on the hour or? I'm not sure. I'm not in, I'm not in a rush personally. It depends on uh, Cassandra. What's the plan there? Um, so I run a scholarship program for high school girls pursuing tech degrees, and I have a meeting for that in eight minutes. Okay, so we start. We need to start wrapping up. Um, uh, were there any questions in the chat? So I haven't got the chat window open. I can't tell whether there's been anything there. Uh, no, not. I don't think so. Okay, are there any just questions in general that I, we can cover before we finish up? Um, I, well, where are we going with this, I guess, is the obvious question. Okay, my plan was, because is, is Tyler around? Has Tyler been in the meeting? He okay. has not. Okay, because what I wanted to really do was to give an idea uh, of what each, what, what we're covering. So we've got a, a wider picture of what SALT formulas as an organization is doing and then for people to pick areas which they'd like to actually discuss in the or what we'd like to tackle but it's only by getting a, a wider picture of what we're actually doing that we can do that maybe I, maybe we just discussed a bit a little bit too much today um, maybe going through it a bit quicker would be more useful in the next in the next meeting I was mistaken, my meeting is tomorrow, so we can stick around a while longer. Apologies for the dog. No, no problem. Uh, how do you feel? Uh, the rest 
to view. I mean, I can carry on for now if, if necessary, and I'll try and go a bit quicker and get through this a bit faster. Yeah, let's carry on if people can. See, I, I haven't got any feedback here from the chat or anything, so I can't tell. Is that okay? Hey, Imran, this is, this is Ken. Um, just if you want to be able to see the chat, you should be able to, if you're on Windows, well, it looks like you're on Linux, so you should be able to do the same, I think. Uh, just hit Alt on your keyboard, and then that should show you the view options. And um, I, think, I think what I meant really is, I, I know how to see it, but I didn't, want oh, okay. to disturb, I didn't want to disturb the screen share with everyone by trying to look at the chat at the same time. Oh, it shouldn't actually show the chat, but okay. Okay. I was thinking maybe anyone else can see what's going on and they can just mention it. Shall I carry on for now? I don't know. How long should I, we have? I don't see any questions, but I am wondering, um, yeah. is anybody taking notes on this meeting? Uh, well, I'm not. Okay. Um, just a style of work that I've seen be successful in the past is just to elect a member of the of the group that's attending to take notes and then be able to forward those notes out to the other members maybe that weren't able to attend in the past, um, et cetera. I don't know if that's something you guys want to do. I think one of the things is, is because these are being uploaded to YouTube now, I thought um, that's one of the way that one of the ways that what ways that's being alleviated a little bit because actually this would be quite heavy in a note format. It would be quite hard to follow. And that, that's the reason why I went to these pains to make the diagram because talking about all these things just verbally would be really hard to understand. Uh, seeing it's a little bit easier. Even then it's not that easy. So they can sure. refer back to the videos, uh, at least for now. And when we get into the, the real deeper discussions about specific topics, I think taking the notes then would be exceptionally important. Uh, sure. I can, can I, uh, I, I'm, I'm quite, I quite agree with Ken about notes, uh, not especially for this meeting, which, which looks like a big introduction of the work which has been done, uh, which is currently done, do it, uh, being done. So maybe it's not uh, necessary for today, but maybe for uh, the next meeting, it could be a good idea. Oh, definitely, definitely for sure. Uh, that, that's a great idea and uh, we can you know try to arrange for someone to uh, or maybe to pass it around a bit so that someone's taking notes during these meetings for sure thank you for that suggestion yeah, yeah. that's very important shall i carry on for now then or shall i wrap up how would you like me to proceed carry on yeah keep carry on. on yeah okay i'll try and go a bit a bit quicker i won't uh, spend so much time so what you have with the, these are our, our main connection from GitHub. So when we send through a PR or a merge, it goes through Travis or, or Cirrus. And all of our testing is passed through Kitchen. Um, so I'm trying to uh, speed up a little. K Kitchen itself, if you used to look at the kitchen.yaml, it, it breaks down into different settings that you provide. So for example, you select uh, your, uh, your driver, whether you're going to use a Docker container or whether you're going to use Vagrant. Uh, so looking at Docker, for example, that's the majority of what we're doing. We've got our seven main OSs here that we, we cover. And we do have maybe Gentoo as well that's going to be looked at in the future. But even the seven we've already got, to be honest with you, are uh, substantial and there's a lot, a lot going on there. Uh, just a quick little point here, we're having one problem with our Docker containers. Uh, recently, there's an actual bug that's been reported uh, where Docker and System D aren't working well together, especially with CentOS 8. Um, you're getting a just. I'm just letting people know this in case someone gets a chance to look into it. I have made an issue here, but the main problem is this error here. For example, uh, the new main PID does not belong to the service, and PID file is not owned by root. Refusing. So there's an issue between uh, the users that are trying to run certain services and, and the system D is not allowing that to take place. So this is on some of the newer platforms and I'm concerned that this will start happening with some of our other platforms as time goes on. So we are running into some issues with Docker, um, but we don't really have an alternative. So if anyone has any ideas about an alternative that can be automated rather than run locally, that would be good to hear or find solutions 
to get around these problems with uh, Docker and System D. So that's via Kitchen Docker, and then via Kitchen Vagrant, we have a couple of Vagrant Im uh, pre-salted images that have been prepared for us. Uh, one for FreeBSD and one for Windows. The FreeBSD one has is no longer working because it's an older uh, system which is no longer in support. When you try to install something on it, it won't actually allow you to do so. So we've, we've lost touch with the maintainer of the, uh, the FreeBSD image. So we'd have to figure out how to get in touch with him again or find someone else who can help us prepare those images. Uh, the windows, uh, David, how's it looking for a newer image, maybe for 3000? Um, I believe that I've, I've done one for 3000, but not 3000.1. Okay. So, I mean, the last one we've got here was the oh, two, right. two by three. Ah, okay. But the box itself doesn't specify the version. So it actually kind of tracks the latest. Oh, excellent. So I was under the impression that they were fixed onto a certain version in. Uh, no, no, but because Windows, I mean, each image is kind of four, four or five gigs. It doesn't, it's not the most efficient to have kind of an image for every version and things like this. So, I mean, this is very much a work in progress, but at the moment, the image itself is only one image, which kind of tracks the latest version. So, yeah, this is all to be worked on, really. There's a lot more to do in this area. So would it just be easiest to have uh, a version of Windows with the latest version of Salt? Would, would that be well, the it would be easier, yeah. And, and that's, kind, that's basically how it operates now. So, yeah, maybe there's a, there's a... I mean, well, this is obviously my work here. The name of the platform shouldn't really be 2019 too. It should... Yeah, it should probably be latest or something like that. Okay, brilliant. That that would be great to see that. So that's something that we can we can look towards. Okay, and uh, talking about the verification. So that's the the platforms that you set in Kitchen.yaml. Whether you're going to use Docker, and you can lay out the platforms you want to to use for that particular formula. Uh, uh, and then you actually set out the verifier. So our main verifier is Inspec. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to think of how to summarize it. What's the best way to summarize it? I think is to look at a run that we've got for uh, Inspec. So if we look at the verification stage, I should really just use Travis because this is quite slow. Uh, let's get a Travis run open. So if we pull this open here, And we go down to the bottom. This is what it looks like when it's uh, running successfully. So it, it runs all the various verification checks and makes sure they're all correct. And it gives us a summary at the bottom, how many controls have been run, how many are successful, how many failures. And it's, it's, it's proving to be very robust and very quick, easy to write as well once you get used to it, even though it is Ruby and it does mean having to have a separate environment on your machine. Once you get used to it, it's actually very, very powerful. And uh, it's, it's, what, it's our main choice that we made. Again, looking back at when we were planning things, we all did settle on Inspect being the, the best idea for going forward for verifications. Right, sorry, gone too far there. Right, next, after this is semantic release. Okay, so coming back up here to this part of the diagram, uh, let's have a little quick look at semantic release. Now, in the early days, when we were talking uh, with Daniel Wallace about how we could make these formulas more useful in the wider community, the, the idea was to use SPM um, to, to achieve that. So if I was to go to the SPM page, the SALT package manager, and the way the SART package man manager works is the formulas will have a, a formula file as mentioned here. And that formula file lays out the details of what, what the formula 
um, what, what platforms it supports, which versions it works on, etc. And this would appear uh, from the SPM side of things, and then it would be packaged and you could actually use it directly via SPM. So we started looking at how we could achieve that like in an automatic fashion, because it, 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 it also requires the version numbers in the formulas to be up to date. So tagging the version of the formula as it progresses. And the solution we eventually found that worked for us quite, quite well is semantic release. Uh, and it's uh, an interesting infrastructure because it does quite a few, it, it gives you quite a lot of power what to do in that release stage when you're actually, all your tests are passed and you've merged into master. It gives you, uh, as it says, a fully automated version management and package publishing. We could even, I mean, if there was an alternative, we could even look at how to make our formulas into packages and publish them in some shape or form, if not SPM, because there were other ideas in the past about using other packaging uh, solutions. So semantic release, the, the idea is to get all the formulas working uh, as semantic release formulas, and then finding this solution between SPM to actually provide that, that, that facility. Now, the problem is, is unfortunately, Daniel Wallace uh, couldn't, um, he had to step back from the community a little bit, he, uh, uh, sometime last year, and a lot of the work that was going towards bridging between SPM and our formulas has, has, has stagnated, it hasn't moved on. So that's one area that I think we could definitely look at or try to find a way to build that bridge again and to see if we can complete that and actually have that up and running. Uh, when we did speak in the open hour, they did mention that separating SPM from salt stack itself is actually uh, something they'd actually like to do. So if someone was willing to take on that project, they could actually take the core of SPM out of salt stack and you know, rapid develop it and prepare it the way it needs to be uh, got ready so that it could be used with, with these formulas. Uh, and like I said earlier on, you know, we have up to, I think, 70, I think now it's actually 75. The, the formulas Nold put in this week are all semantic release enabled. So there'd be 75 formulas that would be ready to go if that, if that was done. So again, anything you want me to stop on, please just chime in. Otherwise, I'm going to keep moving through this to give a, a summary of everything. Um, the next area or another aspect of this was the linters that I've already mentioned. Uh, one of them that's I didn't mention earlier was commit lint so that we can make sure that our commit messages are going to work with semantic release we use a lint called commit lint which allows us to do that so if i just to go into sorry i've hit the wrong button there okay. if i go into the contributing guide we've uh, outlined how the commit messages for our repos needs to be formatted in order to work with semantic release. So it's a type, scope, and a subject, all lowercase. Uh, and what happens when you do that, it provides the change log updated accordingly. So if I was to go to, say, the template formula again, and I was to look at the change log, let's look at the proper one is change log RST. All of this has been automated uh, from the commit messages. So when you put the word fix, it turns into bug, it goes under the bug fix section and your subject is the, the bold section and the rest of your commit message is here. And it also links back to the commit message for you automatically. So you can click on that and get the, as you can see, here's the commit message that was used for that and the change log is populated automatically and it also creates a, a, a release based upon the type of commit message you've used. So for example, if you've used a docs type of commit message, it bumps by 0 0.01. Uh, if you've got a new feature being added to the formula, it bumps by 0 0.1 and so on. And there's a special type of bump, which is called a breaking change. Uh, if anyone, so if you put a breaking change in any commit message at the bottom, 
it will actually increase the, 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 the bump will be another version, another whole version up. So that's the commit link and the semantic release. And an interesting development that we had about a year ago, again, Daniel helped us out with this a lot, was uh, what I call TOFS, but it actually stands for Template Override. And actually, what does it stand for? I'm about to embarrass myself here. Template Override and File Switch Pattern. And the idea behind this is to take your file.managed and turn it, or to supercharge your file.managed. So if I can just scroll down to the useful part of this here, your normal file.manage will look like this. So your source will usually be only one source over here. Uh, and that's quite limiting because if you have a template and you're only using one source across all of your minions, you'll find that that one template won't always do what's necessary for each and every one of those minions. And it's very useful if you can break it down by say a certain type of grain or using the ID of the minion instead and then providing customized templates per grain or per minion. And this is what TOFS allows you, allows you to do. So if I go a little bit further down, we should find here. What you get here now instead, the, the library allows a much more expanded source to be given to the file managed state. Uh, so you can do, like I said, like, like it mentions here, it can look at the OS family and provide a customized template per OS family. So there's a default one, which is for any minion which doesn't match the other criteria. Or if there's a specific uh, template for an OS family, it will use that. Or if there's a specific template for the actual minion ID itself, it will use that. And it gives you a very powerful override again, a bit like the pillar stack idea where you can now have your templates on your file system at any level of granularity in order to provide the exact template you need for any particular minion or group of minions. And it's a, it's a very powerful system. Uh, so some quick examples. Uh, so this TOFS, uh, this TOFS library is being pushed to our repositories by a formula called the SSF formula, which is coming up in the discussion if I can get to it. Uh, what we do have is there are some older version one TOFs which were done manually beforehand and those haven't been converted yet. So that would be a task for someone to look at is converting the older implementations of TOFs to the new version. Uh, but another question is, is it's been running for a while now and in the formulas it has been running it's been be, it's been doing really really well would it be something worth considering actually using tofs for every file managed and every file recurse state we have i mean not obviously right now immediately but over time wherever we have a file managed or a file recurse state to use the tofs pattern and for those who know about it would that be something worth considering Okay, no response, but I'll give an example of a before and after. The salt formula is one of our main formulas. And in the way it was running beforehand is the, um, the master.d directory uh, was being populated using this template over here. And it's a very unwieldy template. It's 1,800 lines long. Uh, and it's doing all sorts of ginger and all sorts of calculations to try to figure out what settings you've got in your pillar. And it's populating almost like a whole master configuration again. Uh, and it's, it's, it's horrible to deal with. Uh, in the first part of the PR I did for this, I actually went through and tried to compare what's changed in the master configuration over four different versions of salt from 2016 to 17 to 18 to 19. And trying to make this, this, this template, this file, appropriate for all those versions of salt so that the pillar could work with them was exceptionally difficult. The new version now, which is using TOFS, is very simple. It's blank. And the idea behind it is, is you simply have the TOFS system provide the values you want per, for your situation. So 
your override files in master.d will usually only be the, the override values. You won't have the whole file produced again from scratch. You'll only add in the things you want to change or override. And what the TOFS allows you to do is, is to only provide the bits you want and leave all the rest behind. So we don't have to rely upon the pillar anymore and thousands of values in the pillar, or so I should say hundreds of values in the pillar instead, just place it into your template in files it, 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 using the file with dot recurse state in this, in, in this case, and it will be populated onto your minions exactly as you need them, you know, whether it's by grain or ID or any other, or any other feature or even the default, if that works for you. So that's a rough angle on TOFs. The next part here is uh, Javier. Did Javier join the meeting? Is Javier around? Okay, what happened is when we first started testing with Travis and Kitchen, we were still using the bootstrap to prepare all of our images from scratch every run. And what Javier did was a fantastic project on the side uh, called the Salt Image Builder. And using this, the all of the platforms are produced. So if I was to go to, for example, this is it'll be easier to see from the Travis view what's going on exactly. Let's view this in Travis. So what this formula, uh, what, what this um, uh, repo is doing is it's actually going going through and preparing images for every combination of platform, um, salt version, uh, Python version, etc. And it's going through and so for all the Amazon Linux, Arch Linux, CentOS, Debian, and these images now are then being pushed up to Docker Hub. So if I was to go to here they're automatically pushed by the Travis run at the end of it, as long as everything's successful. And you have here in Docker Hub pre-salted images of all different combinations. So you want to use a 3001 Pi 3 image, uh, and you look at the tags over here, and you can find which ones have been built. And they're built every week at the very minimum. They're running on a cron job in Travis, being, populated, uh, being built and populated into Docker Hub. So these are regularly kept up to date. And you can find your images here and and use them with salt prepared on them. So you can start verifying, or, uh, you can start converging your, your running your salt states and then verifying them immediately. And that's what we're running now. And it's speeded up our Travis runs immensely. It's made it a lot more um, efficient all around. Now, one of the questions Javier had is, we are currently running it off uh, his net managers organization. And the idea was, could this be moved uh, somewhere else? So he, I mean, one of the ideas is, could it be moved within the SaltStack ecosystem since it's specific to SaltStack and it's providing pre-salted images? And that's something I wanted to ask someone like Tyler to, to send forward as a question from us is, could this repo and the Docker Hub be moved? Uh, is there anyone available who'd be able to pass that question on for us? No, we'll have to try that next week. What was the question? The question is, it, it, well, the question is, is we have a, a repo here that's been working for us now for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what it does, it provides um, what we call pre-salted images. It's, it's making images that can be used for testing immediately. Okay, and it, it automatically pushes these images to Docker Hub which then can be pulled from, you know, your, your testing base, whatever that might be, whether it's Travis or your, whatever CI you're running. And the idea was, is we've got it under the net managers at the moment, uh, the net managers organization. Maybe it would be worth considering moving this up to SaltStack itself. So to have it as SaltStack, Salt Image Builder instead. And that's the question we wanted to push forward for that. It, it's not necessary, but it just sort of makes sense rather than having all of our formulas pulled in from net managers. If this is something that's specific to SaltStack, it, it might be useful for them to have it under their umbrella instead. C couldn't we at least move it to SaltStack formulas, e even if nothing comes from SaltStack? The reason why I'd not want to do that is, as I mentioned, we have a concurrency of five, 
five oh, dogs right. at okay. a time. And right here you can see there's 36. They run pretty fast, but there's still 36 jobs that take place. And that would block us up every time that ran. Yeah, and, okay. Uh, no, I, I can see that. Yeah. So I think either we keep it in net managers, which is, I mean, Javier's fine with that. He didn't say that's a problem, but the idea sort of goes now that it's been running now for the last six months. In fact, these are being used to test salt itself. Uh, we're, we're doing a run every, every week, which runs across the 70 formulas we've got con converted to semantic release. And it runs all our tests against the master branch in salt. So they're, they're providing, they're proving to be very, very useful. And it would be maybe in salt stacks, um, favor to actually consider moving this under that umbrella instead. It doesn't have to happen, but it just makes sense if, it, if they consider it. So that's the net managers point. All right, we'll see what we can find out about that between um, Ken Jordan and I. Okay, fine, fine. I mean, it's not, it's not anything urgent, but it is worth yeah. considering. Yeah, no, that's good feedback. So definitely okay. I'll let you know how to find out. Uh, am I am I losing you with the map or is it okay? I'm just giving you a summary of everything. Is that fine? I'm not going too fast or anything. No, keep okay. going. No. Okay. I'm not going to talk about this very much. Uh, this is another formula that I'm actually maintaining called the SSF formula. It, it's a, it's a, it looks crazy. Uh, it isn't uh, actually da David knows a bit about it. He's looked at it as well. Actually, maybe it is a bit crazy. Well, I, I know a little about this and it's, it, it, it takes a lot to get into the, the whole, the, the whole way it works and all of yeah. that. Yeah, it's quite heavy. It is quite heavy. Just to give you a little snippet from it, just to show how it works, is this is the formulas.yaml file. And for every formula that's been converted to semantic release, so this is the template formula, for example, all of the relevant standardized bits of structure that we can apply, we use this formula to push those changes back to the formulas. So for example, we define the kitchen suites here. So there's two here, for example, there's the first suite over here and all the various settings for that. And the second suite over here and all the various settings for that. And then we define which platforms do we wish to run it against uh, and which suites as well. So that might always be, that, that, that won't always be default. It'll be whichever suites we want to pick from above. So for example, CentOS 6 here for the CentOS 6 box. Uh, any overrides for our linters and whether it uses certain libraries and other overrides. And all the formulas are there. So this is only looking at the YAML side of things, but it shows we can configure and standardize across all formulas from a single formula that does that. And it manages all these various bits. Uh, I, we don't need to go into that, but bits to do with kitchen, to do with inspect, uh, to do with the TOFS area. So when we're pushing TOFS changes out, if we have a change in the library that gets pushed to all the formulas, all the, the linting over here as well, and configuring Travis and Cirrus as well. So that's the angle behind the SSF formula. Oh yeah, and here's the bit where I was saying, using the SSF formula, that's where we run the tests once a week, where we use the newest. So once the cron job runs on net managers, which I just mentioned, which is Javier's, uh, have, once this cron job runs every week, I do a little run from the SSF formula to test the master branch uh, for start stack and see if there's any issues coming up in the formulas that we have. Going back to the diagram. Okay, that's most of the heavy stuff. Uh, here's some of the more organizational issues that have come up. So to do with communication, um, Obviously, there's the Slack channel that we have, which is bridged to Freenode. Um, and there is that issue which you may have heard about, but the Freenode bridge may be uh, needing some modification. Cassandra, was there any updates on that? Anything happened with the IRC bridge? Um, not right now. I think we've put it out as a bridge that we need to get repaired. And I believe a few community members have volunteered to kind of start taking that and working through it. Okay. Um, but I think that's as far as we got is yes, it's a thing that needs fixed and yes, there are people interested in fixing it. Okay. For now, I am at least with major announcements, release news, that sort of stuff, I'm making it a point to post manually in IRC just so people don't miss anything. Yeah. See, the IRC that we've got in Slack is only bridged to, uh, so 
there's two IRC rums that we have, and one is salt and one is salt stack formulas. So it would be quite difficult for us to, but well, we can't actually talk directly into salt stack formulas IRC from Slack. We'd have to use the bridge there, and that's the only way to do it. Never mind, never mind. It's not important. But the, the other nice bit about the IRC bridge, anyway, is that we have a log bot running, which you can use to go through the logs on the uh, Slack channel and search through it for bits and pieces because obviously the Slack, uh, the history does tend to disappear after a short period of time. So the log bot has proved to be very, very useful. Um, looking at documentation, as I mentioned earlier, we have a few ideas about how to document for the whole organization. And there's two ideas that are uh, being considered. One is uh, read the docs which is via Sphinx. So this would be the template formula documentation being produced by Read the Docs. And it's pretty straightforward to set this up because we're writing in RST at the moment. So Read the Docs automatically, once there's a new version, it finds that and it builds the new version for us, which is quite useful. Uh, personally, I find, so that's restructured text. Personally, I find using ASCII Doctor fantastic. It's, I find it very, very powerful. And there's uh, a, a software called Antora. And what this does, it allows you to connect to as many repos as you like, and pull them in into one static site. Um, so for example, this is the template form, the same thing again, but just done in Antora. These are just these, are, these aren't really live. These were just tests that I did last year. But um, these were ideas about how to um, Let's see if I can find a, an interesting bit. I, I just find it a lot cleaner and the formatting is a lot easier and it's got some nicer features like these callouts, for example. You can't, I haven't seen a way to do this in RST, but you can use callouts and then you know explain code underneath a lot easier. Uh, and it, like, like uh, read the docs, you have the versions available, different versions. So every time there's a new version released for a formula, you'll get a new version here in Antora or the selected versions that you want to keep. You don't have to have all of them, of course. So that's the ideas for the documentation is down here. Now, in terms of our GitHub organization itself, I started with the repos, but there are other areas and I want to touch upon them briefly. Uh, one is the teams. So this is a side that maybe a lot of people won't see, but I did want to discuss is we do have a number of people who are within the organization, but very few of them seem to be um, active in recent, in the last year or so at least. Uh, a question I've got is, should we, uh, should we be encouraging more people to join the organization if someone's shown interest in maintaining certain formulas? Would that be a, a good idea? Or is there some other, or should we be reaching out to the, the people that are already here I'm not quite sure how to proceed because I don't want to also trouble people. If people have moved on, you don't necessarily want to chase them too much. So I'm just trying to work out, we do need more contributors and maintainers. What's the right way to go about it? I think a lot of it is that, so one of the common and recurring questions I see from contributors is that people just don't know where to start. Um, they don't know what groups are out there, what things we're working on, what projects we're working on. We're working internally to make some of that stuff a little bit um, more transparent, but I think it's partially a matter of just listening. And if somebody's really interested in a certain topic or a certain work group, invite them to start um, working on that project. Um, kind of a individual touch point. To let you know the history here, these people who are in this team over here, in this group of people, have historically contributed maybe a formula or maybe a number of formulas to salt. So those 330 formulas I mentioned to you earlier, these are the 96 people who've done that at some point. So these aren't new contributors. These are people who've already been through and actually uh, um, helped out in the past, but they seem to maybe have moved on. I, I don't feel comfortable chasing them uh, or asking them to do more. So since they're not really around now, what's the right way to go forward? Because we have, like I said, 337 repositories half of them are only active, but what do we do? Do we encourage more people to join? 
Well, I think we need to start going forward in terms of I think we probably need to start getting some kind of get getting things more organized within the people who are already interested and then I mean this is just my opinion and then maybe well then we'll have something for to invite people to if you see what I mean so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is probably even just the people who are currently interested could probably work in a more efficient manner. Yeah, I agree. It makes sense with any of this sort of stuff to, to start with the people who are actively interested, actively contributing. Um, so this group here and then probably some of the people in the formulas channel and Slack would be your first group to okay. try to engage. Okay. And I, I don't know, I'm just thinking that it might be worth clearing some people from this organization. I mean, if they're not contributing or interested in contributing, there's no point us having 96 people on, on, the, uh, on the list, so to speak. I mean, I, I'm just, you know, throwing the idea out there that maybe yeah. we should streamline things a bit more yeah yeah definitely in fact that goes for our whole that goes for this as well by the way um i didn't put this all all that together to wow people in fact part of the reason i put this out there is i want sustainability uh and wherever there are areas here which aren't proving to be sustainable i'd like to trim them away personally uh, i don't want to attack the formulas themselves because that's the core of what we're doing here but the bits here that are too much you know, maybe to let them, like, for example, we've spoken about the platforms we're supporting. We're taking on seven, maybe eight platforms. Um, do we need to? Is that the right way? Are people even using it? Because we don't have any usage statistics, so we don't know what's actually even being used out there. Is it worth preparing a formula for seven different platforms? Uh, those are sort of uh, the Python idea, which I, I want to briefly touch upon as well, is do we really need to consider Python 2? anymore. I mean, we don't have the resources to sit there making sure everything works on Python 3 and Python 2. So I would be quite happy to see the, the end of Python 2 personally. Of course, others will have their opinions about that. So I'd like to streamline this as well, the whole thing. Uh, so we can see, you know, which parts are necessary and which parts can be pared down or maybe removed. Um, but we can come back to that. One other point we did for a period of time, use uh, a project here and it didn't i mean i we did put some some content in here but it didn't really seem to take off as a it, is there any reason why maybe this didn't why people don't particularly like using github projects anything about it that particularly puts people off well only personally i just don't have any real experience with it I've, I've got nothing against it though. Right, right. Well, this is another one that would have to be looked at into how this can be centralized in one place or another. So that's another aspect of what we've got. Let's see, I'm almost finishing up now. Uh, so certain thoughts, you know, some decisions that we need to consider. I think an interesting one is uh, in terms of audience, um, I don't know who we're, we're making, I don't know who this is for anymore. Uh, meaning in some of the conversations I've seen, some of the historical conversations as well, there's an element of these formulas are for beginners, uh, for people who are getting used to the soul. And coming to this, and it's of an edit slant to it. And amongst us are those who are actually using these in production. But what's our who's our target um audience who are we aiming for or, or let's not answer that now that's a question i think is very important to to consider and the other one that i think is i'm now confused about is where we were aiming towards the spm solution which i was mentioning earlier so we was getting all of these formula ways to work with spm since that's disappeared i'm not quite clear on where we're trying to take the organization 
what, what are our medium and long-term goals? What do we want to achieve in a year's time? And I think that's another question that would be very important to, to answer and to look at. Um, we do have the Python 2 deprecation issue. Uh, quite a few of our formulas are still based on Python 2 and you know, they need to be either translated to Python 3 or maybe those formulas are no longer maintained, I'm not sure, but I think we should be looking at getting rid of Python 2 quite quickly to lower, lower our footprint. Um, there's an issue with topple root, but I won't cover that now. This was quite interesting, looking at the 2015's working group. Um, just have a quick brief look at this because it was quite interesting. But there was a sit down after one of the SALT, um, uh, one of the conferences, the SALT conference in, in 2015. And it seems like a number of people at the time managed to meet up and sit down and write some uh, points down about how to go about improving formulas. And uh, Eric, did you have any comments about this? Because you, you went through it as well. Did you have anything to add about what you saw here? Not, not especially. No, I didn't. I didn't read it all. Okay, but it was quite interesting to see because some parts of it are still resonating today. Some parts of it are still affecting us right now, and so it would be good for someone to maybe find some time to go through. And the comments as well are quite interesting. Uh, to go through this little thread here in in uh, in our in the Google group that's no longer active, but take some of those bits and so for example here I remember this comment here was about for new users you see I remember Forrest I remember coming across him before when uh, I was first contributing to formulas talking about still the case I'm asking um, and other people were talking about using numerous structures to take formulas to the next level and to use a lot more Python and use mod uh, underscore modules, underscore states, you know, providing those in formulas themselves. So this is worth looking at some point if someone gets a chance. And the final points is the Kibana. Yep. Let's have a quick look at this. It's interesting because it's done for salt and for salt stack. Um, someone had gone through and um, uh, made a Kibana Board for salt, a dashboard. So this might take a little bit to load up, but it's, it's worth having a quick brief look at. So I've put both of them together here, the links for both. Let's see if they load up in a reasonable amount of time. Let's close the other tabs. So this is the dashboard for salt, the main salt project itself. And I'm just extend the period so just to get an idea of what's been happening over time and I'll do the same for the salt stack formulas have I opened the same? no I haven't opened the same book can that be it looks identical Something's not right there, is there? It's looking like it's giving us the same data for both. Okay, one second. I did have these open side by side. I'm sure this works. That looks 500 and 120. That's better. Right. So this is the the salt over the last six years and you can see there was a it, Imran you you're breaking up on it a, a bit in the early salt form people getting involved in salt stack formulas has also been decreasing probably matching what's happening with with salt itself um there was another interesting area here. Just if I can. Uh, this was looking at. And I've used red circles, meaning I, I, I found problems when I was looking at the Kibana data. But in terms of the, stati the statistics, in terms of maintainers and reviewers, uh, that's been reducing. 
the official contributors has been reducing, the general contributors has been reducing, uh, and our speed at re responding and closing issues has also, I think that was also reducing. So it looks to things like code owners, it goes back to things like encouraging new contributors to, to the organization in order to be able to become more efficient. Um, so let's have a look just briefly, we'll finish. Any questions while I'm just doing this? No questions? Uh, any information about the, there's a, there's a salt formulas organization. Okay, there we are. Yeah. So again, it's the, uh, even the authors of, uh, where's the PRs, GitHub issues and the pull requests. Let's update this one as well. It would be interesting to do some comparisons across some of the, these these data sets that have been produced to get an idea of what's realistic in terms of our expectations as well. Um, comparing it again to the upstream projects as well, because uh, that might give us a much better idea of a realistic set of targets to go towards. Because again, you can see the general trend over the last three or four years is actually on a downward slope for both projects. Uh, and the, you see the issues waiting to be closed is increasing uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. But that's pretty much it. That's my, that's my summary of, of what we've been doing for the last year and a half. Uh, if there's any particular areas that we want to cover, I think we can cover that in two weeks time. Uh, if there's any particular questions or in areas of interest or problems, we can do that. I don't, I don't have anything else, but um, it's awesome to see a new work group get up and running like this and already have a plan and things in place. So, um. Yeah, thanks. We have been working together for the last, you know, a few of us have been working together. So we kind of already know where we stand with each other, which is very helpful. So yeah. there's no feeling out process. We can kind of get straight to the points we want to discuss. So like I said, in future meetings, we might miss you know, 80% of this diagram and not even talk about it. And that's fine as well. What I'm most interested in is in the next two weeks is for us to figure out areas that we want to delve into a bit deeper and then start looking at those solutions or what we're going to do about those things. Makes sense. Okay. Any, anyone else or? Hey, Imran, this is Ken. Uh, I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind, it's not really a big deal, but uh, I think Windows just often gets forgotten there and Windows Docker actually has support for Windows now. Um, okay, yeah, uh, David, you, you, knew, you found out something about that, didn't you? Um, well, yeah, I think the reason that Imran hasn't put it on the chart is really because we're not using it. Not that it doesn't exist, but believe me, Do Docker on Windows is not um, well developed. It's not mature. Um, even just getting it, getting it to run is difficult, but on top of that, what you can actually do within the Docker container is very limited. Um, like I tried to install Firefox within the Docker container is basically impossible. So at least at the moment, it's not a viable testing option. Oh, really? Okay. Have you so yeah, I think it's, it's not the fact that it doesn't exist. It's just not currently usable for, for our purposes. Yeah, so I'm actually using it now. Um, but, you know, with the Linux subsystem that they have, so I'm using it on my desktop for developing and testing Linux uh, because it actually has the two modes oh, that it can run in right. for Linux and for Windows. 
Um, so I haven't done as much with the, with the windows itself, but that is something I plan to do. Um, so right now I just, you know, I, I just needed something quick one day. And so I just started using Hyper-V um, as some, uh, as a basic VM so I could test something real quick. And so I've just been playing okay. with those things a little bit on the side. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. That is a different, um, area that yes you can run docker on windows that is true i think we at least as far as this organization is concerned we're really thinking about the testing of salt on windows and as far as i have been able to work on it it's it's not in a at a mature stage so, so what we're talking about here specifically is actually running windows on docker so spinning up yep. a Windows instance on Docker, and apparently there are certain features which just aren't available. Uh, was it something to do with files, copying files, David? Um, well, that was actually um, something that I worked out in the end. Is to do with Docker on Windows operates in two two different modes. There's like, I, I, I can't really remember the terms or whatever, but there's kind of like a, a heavy virtualization and a light. And yeah, in one of those modes, you can't actually transfer files onto a running instance, so we, which, yeah, for kitchen is, is basically useless. But you can run it in a different mode, um, which is more like a normal Docker container. So you're running the same kernel. But the problem with that is you have with Windows, the, the, num the images available are tied to the version of Windows that you're running Docker on. I mean, it's all very kind of difficult, really. So at least at the moment, and add added to that is no CI system that I'm aware of uh, supports Docker on their CI system, so for, for, for Windows images. So, uh, yeah, actually, it, it, I don't, it's, it's, it's Cirrus, a no. Cirrus actually does. Um, okay, really? How, yeah, yeah, Cirrus does, and that's another reason why we were looking at it at the time. The problem with Cirrus was the, let me see if I can find it again. Oh, I can't remember where it was. Uh, It'd be, you have to use the provided, oh, how do you get to the Cirrus? See, that's another thing. The interface is quite difficult to use in Cirrus. Right, where are the Windows, Windows containers? Um, it's possible to run Windows containers the same way Linux containers. Um, they, they do have them. They do have them available, but someone would need to look into this to see whether they can be adapted to be used the same way as our Docker containers? Yeah, so I mean, just on that point, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. As you can see, the container image is Windows Server 2019, but it's Server Core, which isn't a fully featured Windows installation. And I'm, yeah, yeah things it's like- It's gonna be very limited to just have like PowerShell installed and that's about it, right? Yeah, so in terms of it being a testing platform, it's just not there yet. Yeah, well, being a container, it's not intended to run a GUI, so it's always going to be something like the Windows Server Core, right? So it's going to be for using it as a server. So if you were to install like IIS or something, I guess. So okay, it, it's, yeah. it's fine. You know, I'm I'm okay to just do the testing in in uh, VirtualBox or whatever uh, through Vagrant. That that's cool. I just it just brought. It I up. mean, yeah. If if there was. You know, th this this particular area is really a work in progress. And if, if we can find solutions, then great. But my investigation so far with win Windows containers on Docker is just not, not really viable. It, it would be great if someone could figure out, you know, how to get it running. That would be welcome, a welcome... Um contribution I mean that's something we'd look forward to if that could be done but in the meantime I mean we do have some formulas with the uh, the kitchen vagrant um, and, and this is pre-salted as well isn't it David so it's ready to go isn't it? it it is yes yeah so we can actually have 
the image is pretty much ready to go and just run your run your tests uh, your your kitchen tests on them pretty much straight away okay and that's actually probably better be able to be able to run the full ui in windows and be able to test installing app okay like user applications that way since that's how the majority of people use windows i believe so yeah i agree with that thanks yeah. thanks guys no problem thank you very okay. much yep so i think that's it for this time yeah for this meeting yeah yeah i think people are starting to drop off so yeah yeah it's been, that's gone a lot longer than we planned thanks a lot for setting that up cassandra you're welcome and i will see y'all in a couple of weeks and i'll try to find out um, the answers to the couple questions y'all had brilliant thanks a lot all right bye everybody bye. okay Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Guys.